people, they might interview adults in the country of residence about their trips to the country of origin years in the past. The result is that large gaps in research exist when it comes to understanding migrant youth's mobility trajectories, their patterns, their experiences, and the effects of mobility on their lives. This is what I set out to understand in my PhD. My research has been part of a larger team project called MoTrail, investigating these questions in four countries, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Ghana. MoTrail stands for Mobility Trajectories of Young Lives, and it includes four projects about Ghanaian background youth, each in one of these countries, as well as a survey of youth mobility patterns in Europe. My PhD was the project in Hamburg in uh, Germany. You might be wondering, why Ghanaian background youth and why Hamburg? Well, first of all, mobility and migration are very common in Ghanaian life and society. Almost half of Ghanaian households have a family member abroad, and it's very common for Ghanaian young people to be mobile for education and family reasons. Second, the Africa-Europe migration flow is relatively recent and understudied, and it deserves far more research attention. And finally, Germany is home to the second largest Ghanaian community in Europe, and Hamburg hosts the largest Ghanaian community in Germany, about 15,000 strong. The research question guiding my PhD was, how do young people of Ghanaian background living in Hamburg, Germany, experience their mobility, their transnational mobility over time and space, and how does mobility affect their lives? To answer this question, I conducted 14 months of fieldwork in both Hamburg and in Ghana. 20 young people aged between 15 and 25 participated in my project, including 14 young women and six young men. Between them, they represented a great diversity of mobility trajectories. Eight were born in Ghana and 12 in Germany, and together they had made 14 changes of residence and 29 visits between the two countries. My research was ethnographic, meaning that I spent several months observing and participating in the lives of young people in my study, so going with them to school and spending time together at home, at church, and in their free time. I also interviewed other important people in their lives, including teachers, parents, and education officials in Hamburg and in Ghana. And a central part of my methodology was my use of mobile methods, or tools that are specifically designed to capture mobility, both in the past and as it unfolds in the present. These tools include mapping young people's mobility trajectories throughout their lives, interviewing them before and after their trips to Ghana, and importantly, actually following their trips to Ghana, both by traveling with them there, as well as keeping up with their trips through social media, messages, and phone calls. I will now briefly outline the findings of the central chapters of my thesis, each on a different aspect of migrant youth mobility, before turning to my overall conclusions. Chapter five investigates the ways in which young people's relationship to Ghana changes as a result of their visits to the country. A lot of research on relationships to the country of origin depicts a rather static homeland and an unchanging relationship to it, whether one of belonging, alienation, or just plain indifference. But a key finding of my chapter is that Ghana is not a monolith and young people's relationships to it are dynamic. Visits to Ghana are made up of an ever-changing array of people, places, and events. And young people are always changing too. The result is that they experience Ghana differently and their feelings about the country change over time. So for example, young people might find trips as teenagers quite boring because they feel confined to staying with family and uh, have to tag along with their parents. But visits as independent young adults can be much more exciting because young people are setting their own agenda. Their experiences and feelings about Ghana also change over space. For example, one young woman in my study was bored with quiet town life while visiting her grandmother, but adored spending time in the vibrant capital city, Accra. As such, I argue in this chapter that the shifting factors that make up young people's visits to Ghana, both over time and space, change their relationships to the country. Chapter six focuses on the young people in my study who attended school in Ghana for several years before moving to Germany around the age of 14 or 15. Most research says that school transitions at this age are problematic and often result in poor academic results and emotional well-being. 
But I noticed during my fieldwork that these participants were all doing very well at school in Hamburg, and I wanted to understand why. By looking at these young people's mobility trajectories, I noticed that they had all attended good schools in Ghana and came from extended family networks, often with quite high social status and significant resources, whether that be money, education, or status. These experiences in Ghana then gave them valuable resources that moved with them to Germany and helped smooth their entry to school in Hamburg. In the chapter, I describe four of these resources, or in this case, cultural capital, that my participants demonstrated. Confidence, discipline, respect, and adaptability. For example, the confidence they had in their intelligence that came from a history of high achievement at private school in Ghana helped young people persevere through the early challenges of learning German and adapting to a new curriculum. By describing these young people's mobility trajectories, including both their schooling and family life in Ghana, as well as their transition to school in Hamburg, I argue that migrant students are not blank slates when they arrive in the country of residence, but rather they bring resources, knowledge, and skills that play a vital role in their school transitions. Finally, chapter seven explores the role of young people's transnational peer relationships, which I define as relationships between young people, whether that be relatives, friends, or romantic partners, that are maintained between two or more countries. Such relationships were very common among my participants and yet have hardly been the focus of research. In the chapter, I show that young people establish these relationships when they live in or visit Ghana, either by attending the same schools or living in the same neighborhoods or even households as their peers. They then maintain these relationships through spending time together during visits to Ghana and through the use of digital technologies. So for example, my participants made music with their cousins online, they uh, called their boyfriends on WhatsApp every day, or they even had regular study sessions with their friends via video call. In this chapter, I frame two resources that young people gain from these peer relationships as social capital. The first is educational motivation, which is provided through young people's emotional support, the role modeling of positive behaviors, and through healthy competition between peers. The second resource is what I call transnational frames of reference, or the ability to compare different aspects of life between Germany and Ghana, which in turn helped young people to gain fresh perspectives on their lives and opportunities. To close, I will briefly outline the five main conclusions and contributions of my thesis. First, my thesis demonstrates that transnational mobility has been neglected in research, and yet it is a crucial piece of the puzzle for understanding the lives of the increasing proportion of young people with a migration background. Using the concept of transnational youth mobility trajectories allowed me to focus both on individual mobility experiences, like a migration to Germany or a visit to Ghana, but also to zoom out and look at young people's entire patterns of mobility and how these affect their lives. Second, my thesis shows that one of the main effects that mobility has on the lives of migrant youth is through the resources that move with them between countries. Most research on migrant youth looks only at resources available to them within the country of, uh, of residence, the country they live in. But my thesis shows that when we look at young people's mobility trajectories, we see that they also gain resources, like confidence, discipline, uh, or educational motivation, in the country of origin, and then translate and use these resources in the country of residence. Third, the fact that migrant youth can successfully translate and use these resources across countries is thanks to their agency. Far from being totally dependent on their parents and other adults to connect them to Ghana and provide resources, the young people in my study actively pursued opportunities, invested in or retreated from relationships, and actively reflected on the meaning of their visits to Ghana. Fourth, young people's transnational mobility trajectories help explain the interactions between their different social statuses in Germany and in Ghana. We know from previous research that adult migrants often have a higher status in the countries that they come from than in the countries they migrate to. So think, for example, of the cliched story of migrant doctors driving taxis or teachers waiting tables. My research shows that migrant youth also have different social statuses between the different countries. Most of my participants came from relatively privileged backgrounds in Ghana, but all were working class in Hamburg. 
By looking at mobility trajectories, my research also shows how these social statuses are related to one another. For example, I found that the resources gained from their privileged uh, family backgrounds and quality schooling in Ghana helped offset some of the disadvantages of their working class position in Hamburg, like during their school transitions. Fifth and finally, these theoretical insights were only possible because of the innovative methodology that I used. My methodology was youth-centric because it placed young people's own voices, experiences, and perspectives at the heart of the research, which is not common uh, in the general focus on adult migrants. And it was mobile because it researched their mobility in various ways, including following mobility in real time, to capture what they experienced, how they felt about it, and how mobility affected their lives. You might be wondering why all of this matters and whether my findings are relevant beyond my particular case study. Of course, I cannot claim that my 20 participants are representative of all migrant youth everywhere, but my research does show the importance of paying attention to the role of mobility in the lives of migrant youth. And my findings point to dynamics that should be investigated further among other groups of migrant youth in other places around the world. By asking new questions, we find new answers. And this is something relevant to migrant youth everywhere and to the educators and policymakers that influence their lives. I would like to close with the words of one of my participants, Isaac, a 21-year-old young man who grew up in Ghana and moved to Hamburg at the age of 16. Isaac told me, when you are in one place, you don't get the advantage to see a lot or know a lot, but there is a whole lot in this world that you have to explore to find. Thank you for your attention. I hand the word back to the prorector and I look forward to the Defence Committee's comments and questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. The opposition will now be opened by Professor Elisabeth Wesseling, Professor of Cultural Memory, Gender and Diversity at our Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, Maastricht University. Dear Promovenda, dear Laura, first of all, many congratulations uh, with the completion of your dissertation, and a good one it is. It is theoretically sophisticated, methodologically articulate. It is driven by questions that are both academically and societally relevant. And I think it's safe to say that together with your colleagues from the MoTrail project, you have substantially augmented our understanding of migrant youth. Um, today, I would like to discuss a methodological issue with you namely your own positionality as a researcher and the way in which this may have shaped, influenced, impacted on the data uh, or the, the, the input of your respondents. Um, you are Western, you are white, you are highly educated, you are climbing even higher today um, most likely from a middle-class background. Um, and this may go to explain why you consider um, success in secondary and tertiary education a highly important indicator of transnational youth's well-being um, in the country of residence. You paint an overall fairly optimistic, if not roseate, picture of uh, well, the well-being of Ghanaian youth in Germany. And uh, uh, sometimes, or in fact quite often, I get the impression that your respondents are trying to live up to the standards that you embody as a researcher. You inform us in your dissertation that you have managed to establish a good rapport with your interviewees by saying that you are a migrant, just like them. I beg to disagree, by the way. I would prefer to call you an expat. Um, and that may well have caused them to, uh, to live up to your standards. And especially when I read the quote with which you ended your presentation, the quote from Isaac, I sense rather strongly that, um, that I'm listening to a person who's trying to live up to you and the standards that you personify. It almost sounds as if uh, migration only has gains and no losses at all. 
So my question is, um, have you thought about the effects that you may have on the answers that your uh, respondents provide you with? And if so, what have you done precisely to counter this uh, predictable effect? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words about the thesis and also for this very interesting question about my positionality and the effect of this on, on my research. Um, I, and I would like to address this sort of in two main parts. First, about how I actually coped with or, or tried to grapple with the impact of my positionality on the research, and then also to address perhaps this issue of the very rosy picture that, uh, that comes across in my thesis. Um, so first of all, in regard to positionality, Indeed, I, I absolutely agree with you. I am certainly not similar in many ways to my participants. Um, and this is something that I, I also acknowledge in, in the methodological chapter uh, in terms of my being a, a white, middle-class Western researcher, indeed highly educated. Um, but I think that often I find in, in debates around positionality, sometimes this is taken on in a highly self-critical way, only seen as a negative or something that can uh, somehow block our access to finding the truth uh, um, about our research participants. And I tried to, to both kind of be aware of, but also embrace my positionality and the view that it could give me into the lives of, of my participants. So I by no means am claiming that I am providing the, the only or even the most comprehensive or accurate picture of their entire lives and impact of their mobility, but rather my positionality gives me access to a certain, a certain view of this particular topic. Um, and I think that one, uh, but I did of course try to, um, try to make sure that I was aware of this positionality and its impact. And I did this in a few different ways. Um, so you were mentioning that perhaps young people were trying to live up to my expectations in what they told me. Um, but there were two things I did here to try and counter this effect. And one of it was really, I would go back to the youth centricity of the methodology, which is not only about making the topic of the research about youth, and it's not only about talking to youth, but it's also really about trying to involve young people in the research in a way that I can see more of their lives. So for sure, things like Isaac's quote, um, I got told these stories, but I also observed these young people over a long period of time, spent time with them at their churches, in their homes, on their trips, and for the young people that were doing well and were able to both gain and then use these resources throughout their trajectories, um, this was evident also in other parts of their life. So the observation was very important. The long-term uh, nature of being exposed to young people's lives was important. And I think this also helped also in repeated interviews or conversations with young people. I think sometimes in research, if we only interview people one time, Sure, they might sort of tell you what you want to hear or what they think the right answer is, uh, so to speak. But I think that by really building a relationship and talking f about several topics over many, many months, this effect is somewhat countered. So the youth centricity was very important. But the other thing I tried to do uh, in this respect was also triangulation with other uh, data sources and points. So very important were also my conversations with their teachers um, to see what they really thought about how these young people were doing, as well as my observations actually in uh, their classrooms. And then a little bit more removed from that, and I'm thinking particularly about education, um, was also my interviews with education officials, both in Hamburg and in Ghana, and their general sort of perspective on how the Ghanaian community, or the, the particularly in the case of newcomer youth, how they were doing uh, in the education system too. Um, so, uh, so these were the things that I tried to do to make sure that my positionality was not acting completely as a blind spot. It, of course, shaped my access and my also, my interest in education came from my own research background in education, um, but I did try to, to make sure it was uh, somehow nuanced. Um, in terms of uh, it being a too rosy picture, I, I, I certainly agree that the overall picture of my thesis is a rather positive one, and I, uh, but I would also uh, point out that there are examples in my thesis of negative experiences that young people had during their mobility. For example, having deteriorating relationships during a visit to Ghana, or being uh, confronted by someone in Ghana very angrily and feeling very upset by this. Um, but I would here also distinguish between a negative experience and a negative outcome uh, in their mobility. Um, and 
and, and also I think one thing that's very important is that this positive picture also is about answering my specific research questions or my sub-questions. Mm. And these questions emerged from my observations in the field, so I was noticing uh, that these positive effects were occurring and I sharpened my research questions to focus on them. And this is what the thesis answers. So it isn't a catalogue of absolutely every effect uh, of their mobility, um, but it is focusing on how transnational mobility relates to these resources. Thank you. I find your answer very eloquent and uh, satisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Dr. Virg Virginie baby -Colin. She's not here today. She's Professor of Geography at Aix-Marseille University, and her question will be read out by Professor Wesseling. Right. Um, uh, the question of uh, Professor Baby Collin relates to the use and role of gender in your thesis. In the chapter's conclusions, as well as in the general conclusion, the question of gender is raised as a further avenue that the data did not allow to address. Nonetheless, as you mentioned that point repeatedly, could you try to go a bit further and elaborate on gender issues related to your methodology, youth na transnational mobility, and school transitions? The whole sample um, contains 14 female and six male participants. From a methodological and reflexive point of view, was it easier for you as a woman to do an ethnographic research with female participants? How did your gender positioning, there we have it again, affect the fieldwork with girls or boys? Chapter five, which focuses on transnational mobility and trips to Ghana, draws mainly on three cases of young women, which you justify because the participants who traveled to Ghana during the fieldwork period were all female. Is this incidental? Or do your data allow you to elaborate some hypotheses according to a gender differentiation in these trips to the origin country? For example, would they be more common among girls? Chapter six draws mainly on the case of seven students, five male and two female. These girls are also the only ones to have attended gymnasium while none of the boys did. Is this also incidental, or could there be a gender differentiation, as observed by several authors, showing better uh, educational achievements among girls? More broadly, in a transnational perspective, how may cultural differences between Ghana and Germany, related to gender, intervene in youth transnational mobility and school achievements. A highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the question. And uh, I'm very sorry that uh, Professor Babi Kolan cannot be here today, but thank you very much uh, to her for sending in this very interesting question and thanks for sharing it. Um, I'll do my best to, to answer this and also address some of the points from the different chapters as relates to gender. But my first comment would be, Yes, absolutely. The, going back to the issue of positionality, of course, uh, my gender, uh, I think, did uh, make it easier for me to access and to get young women to participate in the project and also to have um, stronger relationships that also lasted over time. In terms of the sample or the subsample that went to Ghana, that was completely beyond my control and it happened to be uh, five young women. Um, but I do think my positionality did uh, shape my access for sure. But as I say in the thesis, while I think this would be a very interesting area of future research to look at the impact of mobility, um, it's not something that I was particularly focused on and my research questions were not designed around this. But I can certainly share some sort of preliminary thoughts or hunches on what the impact of gender uh, might be. 
Um, I think in relation maybe to, I'll talk briefly about chapter five and then chapter six, uh, in relation to the visits that I talk about in chapter five, the visits to Ghana, um, I would guess, and because I had no male participants that traveled to Ghana during this time, although I spoke to young men about their visits, my hunch here would be that the different gender roles between Ghana and Germany do play a role in how these visits perhaps play out or what their effects might be. Um, and I think I actually mention in the chapter, well, in chapter five, I mention a case of one young woman who was very restricted when visiting her grandmother's house in a rural town because there had recently been a spate of kidnappings and so her family was very protective and wanted to make sure she also always had a male chaperone when leaving the house. Um, in chapter seven on peer relationships, I talk about how one young woman is discussing with peers in Ghana um, the different levels of freedom that she has as a young woman in Ghana and Germany. So I certainly think there are, are gender dimensions, um, but this was not something I was looking at specifically in my data. In terms of chapter six, um, this is an interesting point that you make that the two girls out of the seven were the ones who had attended a gymnasium and the five boys hadn't. I, I, to be honest, I think this is incidental because I know that at least two of the young men in that sample actually had the offer or the option to attend a gymnasium and they, for very strategic reasons, actually chose to stay in the Stadtteilschule, in the comprehensive school. And I'm actually writing a paper at the moment with some other colleagues about these strategic navigations of the system. Um, and I won't go into all the reasons for that, but I, just to say that I think this was incidental and the, the research that we have that talks about the better educational outcomes of young women as opposed to young men, uh, at least in my sample and what I saw and also in talking to the teachers um, that I, I did research with, um, this wasn't the case for the Ghanaian uh, newcomer youth. They all came, as I mentioned, from very high quality schooling backgrounds. Um, they all had been high achievers. They were all extremely motivated. And I really don't see a difference there between young men and young women. And certainly these respectful relationships and very disciplined attitudes the young men had in the classroom uh, led to these positive relationships with teachers as well that um, did not seem to suggest any, any gender differentiation in their outcomes outcomes in schooling. But finally, I would like to wrap up by saying that I think this is a really important area for future research, as I also mentioned in the thesis. And I think going back to positionality, one of the really important points here is that this field of research is dominated by female researchers. And I actually think we need more male researchers uh, who would again bring different access, a different lens, and surely different insights and findings. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Dr. Maggie Long, Professor of International Development Studies at the University of Amsterdam. Thank you, Chair. Dear candidate, as I read your book, I was very attracted by the photos you have inserted, and now again in the presentation. Um, you also mentioned a photographic workshop that unfortunately did not take place because, as you said, right, young people were not interested in such activities. Um, I assume when I read that you, know, you, are, uh, you have a professional background in visual methods, and this morning I learned from Valentina um, that it is the case that uh, you have such a professional background. Um, the photos in your book are beautiful, and they for sure have done something to me, you know, feelings. Um, can we consider these photos as sensory presentations or repre representations? Um, of the processes that you're studying. Um, you also, in your thesis, you also have written a few times about the lack of sensory uh, analysis or representations in the field. So I'd like to engage you here. Please tell me a little bit more about these photos. How did you choose the photos that you end up using? What do you want these photos to actually show? Can we even consider them as collaborative productions between you and your research participants? As you just also said that you involve young people in your research the whole time through. Um, yeah, please let me know a little bit from, from your visual methods background. 
Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much uh, for this very interesting question and the opportunity to talk a bit more about the visual aspect of my work. Um, I, I, I mentioned it very briefly in the explanation of the images and the thesis, but um, just to elaborate a bit more, this is actually an area of my research that I would like to develop uh, further now. Um, so these photos that, uh, that you see on the screen today and that are in the book are taken from video footage um, that I would like to now actually make into an ethnographic film um, about my research and I, I'm working on that idea at the moment. Um, I, I think certainly, and this is an interesting question to consider, sort of a chicken and an egg question in terms of the, the sensory role of these images, is was my background really sort of uh, attuning me or sensitizing me to these sensory aspects of my field and of the research? Um, or was it actually uh, doing this research then sort of made me realize this would be really nice to capture in the images? I think it's a little bit uh, of both. Um, and I do think that these are my intention, at least with including them in, in the thesis, is that they, of course, add a bit more color in life, but that they do at least hint um, at this more sensory and embodied type of experience that I'm trying to convey also through the written word uh, in my thesis. And these kind of the scenes and the people and the interactions and the, the, the textures that you can get from, uh, from these photos. I certainly think that when it comes to the video footage, that is far more effective at actually portraying these sensorial aspects of their mobility. But I hope that with the photos, there is at least some sort of nod to the argument in my thesis about the sensory nature and the embodied nature of mobility. Um, and, and this question um, about the collaborative element with participants, this is an interesting one to consider because as you mentioned, uh, this wasn't, and I, I think I write about this in, in uh, chapter four around the youth centricity and what this actually means. And often I think we tend to think that it means having very participatory research with young people as co-researchers and being deeply involved in all of the stages of the research. This for me was not possible. Young people were very happy to spend time together and have me tag along, but they weren't interested in doing the photo workshop or in having a more invested involvement. This was my project to do. Um, but there were other ways in which I tried to make uh, all of my research as well as the visual aspect youth-centric uh, and to a certain extent collaborative. And um, two things I would say uh, or give as examples of this in terms of the choice of these photos. First of all was my approach to consent when actually taking this footage. Um, so the young woman in particular who I followed, uh, she we had uh, quite detailed talks about this before um, the project and before the trip, and she had veto power during the trip to always tell me, stop filming now, I don't want you to film this, and also by contrast to say, Laura, come film this, this will be really interesting for you. So there was certainly a sense of collaboration in the choice of what was captured, and then also in the choice of how to use the images and which to use, I've always consulted with the participants involved and told them the context in which they will be used, shown them the images, and gotten their feedback. Um, and so far that has always been uh, quite positive feedback um, so far. But I am really hoping to continue this line of work further and really look also at, at what else comes out or what other findings or insights can we get from a more audiovisual approach um, to this particular topic. I uh, just follow up a little bit that, uh, first of all, I got so carried away from the beautiful photos. I forgot, of course, I should say, and I wanted to say, I want to congratulate you, of course, for having written a very nice, engaging thesis. Uh, it was a joy for me actually to travel a little bit with you uh, at the corona, during the corona time to Hamburg and different places in Ghana. So thank you for that and eavesdropping all these many conversations you have. Um, do I have a little bit of time? to follow up on this question. Just, so do you, do you consider these um, photos, that you have used these beautiful photos, as um, f good uh, representations of what you were studying or trying to also conceptually engage in the thesis? Or are they actually more, as, as you say, provide sensory um, materials? Then I would ask, what kind of senses are these then? Mm, I find this, this question of whether they're good representations or good presentations quite difficult because also because I know how much more data there is and indeed taking stills from the video for me then the video is the fullest good uh, presentation and these really 
become, in comparison at least to the video footage, more of an illustration or something that is complementing the written text. This, these images are certainly not doing the same kind of heavy analytical work that I would hope then an ethnographic film could do, for example, where it really on its own is making an argument uh, with, with the data um, that I have in video. So I don't think these are the best uh, presentations, but I think uh, I at least chose these photos um, to to connect with the chapters that they are, are placed in in the book and to somehow speak to them. I chose not to use captions, for example, I had a big debate with many colleagues about this and I chose in the end not to use captions because I really wanted to encourage readers to actually do a bit of that work themselves and leave the interpretation open to a certain extent uh, to find those connections. Um, shall, I, shall I end there and move on? Okay, I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you so much. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Michaela Vanore, Research Fellow, United Nations University Merit. Thank you very much. Uh, dear candidate, dear Laura, thank you very much for allowing us the chance to read this book and to learn more about your work through the presentation and discussion. In view of time, I think I can keep my comments a bit short, but I would like to begin by saying that I really appreciated the beautiful balance in your thesis between intimacy and distance. Something I really appreciated is that you used an incredible multiplicity of data sources to explore the very intimate realities of young persons' lives, but you also do put distance between their experiences and the expectations of the reader by adding in theory and so on. I also really appreciate that you used vignettes and you used very specific cases to demonstrate more complex ideas. And of course, there's always a trade-off that comes in this choice. You have made the choice to focus on specific individuals and specific contexts so that your reader is able to isolate out some of the, the key findings that are probably present in many of the other individuals, but that you feel are most embodied in specific persons. Well, I really do appreciate the multiplicity of data sources and persons that you interviewed. I was struck a bit when I was looking at one of the table summaries that you have in the methodology section on the amount of contact and the amount of observations or of data that you collected on different participants. And what I noticed is that there's a very unequal collection of data across participants and in a sense also across data methods. It's not always clear what kind of data is used in the analysis and which data sources were most drawn upon in certain chapters. So I have a, a question more about individuals. Some respondents, like for example, Vera, Constance, and Isaac, you had very limited observation content for. And yet Isaac in particular shows up in several of the vignettes. I'm very curious if you think that there's a bit of a self-selection of respondents into limited data collection. So are there characteristics that you feel drive the lack of observation or the lack of data that you have on specific individuals? And if so, what do you think the implication or the consequence is of, of that self-selection on the outcomes that you eventually derive? Esteemed opponent, thank you for the, the very nice compliments on the thesis and also for this question. Um, I, think, um, I think I'd maybe like to address this in sort of two main points. First, I think this uh, example of Isaac is a really interesting one to think with in terms of um, the, like you say, the unequal amounts of data or access I might have to different participants and yet their role in the actual thesis or in the analysis and how I then use them also to make certain analytical points. And then also talk a little bit just about the nature of field work itself. I think with Isaac, he's a really interesting example because like you say, I, I use uh, his case a few times throughout the thesis and I indeed quoted him today um, in the presentation. And I think this also relates to just like you said, the point that I am not only talking about individual cases, but I am using individual cases or nice vignettes or particularly powerful quotes to be able to speak to findings that I had across my sample. And this was very much the strategy in selecting the particular cases that I use uh, in the empirical chapters of the thesis. So I think in the end, I feature and talk specifically about 10 of my 20 participants in the thesis. But indeed, the analysis that was done in the empirical 
multiple chapters is really looking at the entire sample and really trying to choose the cases that somehow best exemplify the dynamics I found across the sample. Um, and Isaac, I think, is an interesting case because he was someone that actually became involved in the research at quite a late stage. But by the time that he had uh, he became involved and was a participant, um, I already had these emerging findings. I had really refined the way I did my data collection. I knew exactly what I wanted to ask him. I knew what my emerging findings were and how I could try and find the data that was most relevant to my research questions. Um, and also, he was just a particularly eloquent uh, and open person, which also then, of course, helps when having to choose things like quotations. Um, also, uh, he was friends with a few other participants. And so while I didn't have a huge amount of data collection on him, I did have more sort of contextual knowledge also about his friendship circle and his community environment in Hamburg. Um, and then to sort of say something about the general nature of fieldwork, I think that this is to a certain extent inevitable uh, in ethnographic fieldwork, that there is this kind of unequal collection of data across participants and also different levels of access to participants. And I think here this goes to your question about self-selection, that I think to a certain extent there were young people I met, of course, who didn't become uh, involved in my project. And of course, it's a, this is also a collaboration uh, in a sense of doing ethnographic fieldwork that the young person has to be willing to participate. And I certainly think that um, while I think my findings definitely stand for the sample I have, and I also I think, while I can't say they're representative of the entire Ghanaian community in Hamburg, from the triangulation I did of speaking with education officials um, at the municipal level in Hamburg, of speaking to teachers who had uh, been involved or taught several Ghanaian youth, my participants were certainly not anomalies. But of course, I didn't have as easy access to the cases that weren't going well educationally, for example. Or to put it, uh, to give another example, I also wasn't looking at people who were immobile. Um, a selection of criteria was that they had to be mobile. So I certainly think there is an element of self-selection, both in what I was looking at as well as the participants who wanted to participate. But I still think that with the, the youth-centric approach and the triangulation I did, the findings still stand, even for those participants who I maybe had less data on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Joris Schrappendonk, Associate Professor of Geography, Radboud University. Dear candidate, um, you've written a fantastic thesis, and uh, congratulations. Um, my words of praise are short, also in terms of time. I will keep the rest for the lunch, uh, in more detailed uh, words of praise. I part particularly like how you translated the dynamic worlds of trajectories into five crystal clear and valuable contributions to intersecting fields in the conclusion. I think it's a fantastic achievement. I will bring you to one of my personal highlights of your thesis, the taxi driver. And for those uh, who would like to reread uh, the moment of the confrontation, confrontation between one of the um, informants and the taxi driver is on page 96. That moment um, shows the confrontation between you know, the, the mobile people and those perhaps in Ghana and that it's not always cozy and not always smooth and there's a lot of social confrontation. But that moment is also one of the few moments in your thesis that's really where the action of mobility happens, sitting in a taxi. And that made me wonder, is your thesis not more on the effects and consequences of mobility, especially in chapter five, and not so much on the practices and the doings of mobility. You have been on airports, but it's very marginally present. You've traveled with them, but it's very marginally present in your thesis. So I will challenge you with this. Have you not too much focus on the effects of mobility instead of the practices of moving? Esteemed opponent, thank you. Uh, thank you for the, the compliments and also for this question um, on the actual nature or type of mobility I was really looking at. And indeed, if I'm looking more at the effects rather than the mobility itself, I think this is actually a really, a really interesting question. Also, 
in terms of something you were mentioning at the beginning of your comments about the intersection of different bodies of literature. And I think also then for me comes the question of how do we define mobility exactly? Is it these kind of moments of someone actually physically being in motion in a taxi or being at an airport about to get on a plane? Or do we have a sort of broader view of what a mobile experience can be, which can be an entire visit uh, to Ghana, including plenty of moments of being quite stationary and immobile? Um, yeah, no, no, I, I think this is fantastic because I, I, I like your answer and I'm very happy with it. At the same time, your emphasis on proximity in that chapter five mm -hmm. might have hampered the mobility aspects of it, no? because it's in the end, face to face, face to place, it's, it's very in place and not mobile. So I want, maybe you could reflect a little bit on why proximity, why was this so central in chapter five in relation to mobility? Thanks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think if I go back to this point of how we then define mobility, I think for me, I'm, I think in mobility studies, it very much is this approach on the actual being physically in motion. I think in the intersection of bringing mobility studies into conversation with transnational migration, and particularly when I bring it into conversation with other literatures that usually have nothing to do with mobility, like cultural capital and education or with youth studies, um, I think then my view of mobility is a bit broader in consideration the entire experience, including those moments that aren't mobile. And in that case, I think if I consider, for example, an entire visit to Ghana as being a mobile experience, then the proximity is indeed important, even in those moments where someone is not moving. Um, and that the proximity really helps me, and in using Ari's typology of proximity, uh, which also comes from, from mobility studies and looking at these kinds of, uh, these sort of trips and experiences, really helps us get at what is this mobility experience of the visit actually composed of? And, and as I write in the thesis, this is something I think has really been lacking in our understanding of migrant youth mobility and the impact of these visits is getting this finer grain understanding of what, what is it actually composed of. So in terms of especially the, the visits that I accompanied of my participants, it was very much about these face-to-face -face moments. It was about certain events like the, the taxi driver, which happened to be one of the few that was in motion, um, and about the, the certain places that they were visiting and walking through and spending time in. So I think for me it's in bringing these literatures together, my view of what counts as actually a mobility experience or a moment of mobility is a broader sense that includes being, uh, traveling to and then being somewhere else. And also I think important here maybe to very briefly mention is the, the trajectory approach. So also understanding these things across the life course rather than only focusing on what's happening within one particular visit or mo mobility experience. If we then see mobility as more of the moving between between contexts, um, then we're able to then look also at what happens on a visit to Ghana and how that would affect another part of their life in another place and the way they are mobile between these two. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Javier Carinther, Acting Professor of Intercultural and International Comparative Education at Hamburg University. Yeah, thank you, dear candidate. Thank you for this, <coughs> sorry, impressive work. I have, um, I like very much to to, list, uh, to read the work. I especially, uh, I think it gives the opportunity to the reader to follow the perspectives of your of your participants and and to win insights in the perspectives of the participants. And uh, one of the other things I like very much of your work is how you depict that your participants uh, succeed in, in a school in, in Hamburg, uh, not despite, but because of their Ghanaian background and because of their transnational resources. So um, you attribute this success in, in their attitudes of confidence, discipline, respect, adaptability, as well as to, to the high motivation they develop in transnational peer relationships. But you also write that these attitudes are, um, are one part of a chemical reaction uh, between this resource and the recognition in the reception context. And I'm very curious to hear about the other part or the other parts 
of this chemical reaction. So could you say something more about the role of schools and teachers in Hamburg? Which role do teachers play in the successful educational trajectories of your participants? And do you perhaps have some insights about how this compare with, with other cities considered in the Motri project? Esteemed opponent, uh, thank you very much for the kind words about my thesis and also for this question that gives me the opportunity to talk more about uh, the educational context that a lot of my participants uh, were, were in in Hamburg. Um, indeed, so in chapter six, I talk about what I term a chemical reaction between the resources that young people brought with them from Ghana and then the reception context in which they land and how this actually acknowledges and then gives value to these resources, making it possible for young people to actually activate them. Um, and the role of schools and, and particularly of teachers is of course absolutely vital uh, to this chemical reaction. Um, I think some of the things I noticed uh, about the teachers that these young people, uh, the classes uh, they were in and the teachers leading them was partly about the teacher's background and I think this really points to an important aspect of the professionalization of teachers who are actually running these reception classes uh, for young people. A lot of the teachers in whose classrooms I did observations um, were teachers who had very international backgrounds themselves, even if they were native German teachers, they had studied abroad, they had studied things like anthropology or intercultural education, they um, had spent time abroad themselves in educational uh, contexts. So they already had their own kind of transnational background through which they could relate to young people. Um, and, but also I think the relationships that they were able to build with young people, this was also very much a two-way street. So while the teachers were very open and welcoming and I think willing and able to recognize certain resources that young people brought with them, I think what's also really interesting here is to then look, and this goes to one of the, the main conclusions of my thesis around young people's agency, that it was also, this relationship was very much a co-construction and it was very much through young people bringing this, this, um, this kind of habitus or aspect of respect to the teachers that then the teachers responded very well to. I mean, I certainly saw other relationships with these same teachers that were not as positive um, as with my participants. So this wasn't something that only came from the teachers um, themselves. It was also very much from young people's agency. But the teachers are absolutely fundamental to this process without a doubt. I think to say very briefly about a comparison with the Motrail, uh, other case studies, this is something that I can't say very definitively or authoritatively yet. We're just now starting this comparative analysis of really doing the, the tricky and sticky work of trying to actually compare um, what are very different case studies, not only different Ghanaian communities and migration histories, but also very different, of course, contexts. And part of this is very different educational systems. I think some preliminary thoughts on this question would be that Hamburg did seem to come up over and over again in our in our team meetings and uh, sharing of our findings. Hamburg seemed to be quite a positive case in comparison to the other European cases. And I think that this might have to do uh, potentially with actually the Ghanaian community itself uh, in terms of its migration history and the, the socioeconomic profile of the Ghanaian migrants moving to Hamburg, but also the, the social and political environment of Hamburg that is, as I said in the presentation, extremely diverse, as you, as you well know yourself. Um, half of young people in, in Hamburg have a migrant background. So I think this aspect is really important, but I also think the structural aspects of the education system are very important too. And I think this is something that really other school systems could learn from the Hamburg case in terms of both the structure of the reception classes that newcomers uh, enter into that work, of course, not always, but in certain cases can work very positively and give these great outcomes for young people. Um, but also then once they leave these reception classes, going into this two-tiered system um, or this tracked system of Stadtteilschule and the more prestigious gymnasium, 
but that in both of these uh, school types, young people can actually go on and get the qualifications to go to university. So I think it's really this chemical reaction, if I and I would love to write more on it in the future, because I think indeed, while in this chapter I was really focusing on the resources that young people brought to the table, I think I then leave open this question for future publications of what are the other elements of this chemical reaction? And I think teachers, but also the structure, are absolutely fundamental to making at work and to providing these positive outcomes for young people. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, now it's tricky. We have about two minutes left. <laughs> so I will give Professor Long the opportunity to delve into the question, but we might be interrupted by the Bidel. A privilege. <laughs> um, very quick. I, I, I'm still a bit uneasy. I feel uncomfortable about this rosy picture and the positive chemical reactions. So my question is, or my mo encourage you to maybe do dig out a little bit the not so positive or maybe even dangerous chemical reactions that you might have seen or uh, maybe not from the 20 people you, you talk to, because I find it hard to believe that exclusion and racism did not play a role in this very, surely very diverse, dynamic, and very power charge um, transnational social field where you study. So that's my question comments, but maybe you can say a few words before she comes. Sure. <laughs> um, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for this, this question. Indeed, this is something, um, well, it has various elements to it. Of course, like you say, um, I wasn't focusing as much on these chemical reactions, potentially dangerous or far more negative ones than my participants. I wasn't looking for them or focusing on them beyond my particular sample. Um, but the issue you point to of discrimination and racism, I think actually is a very important one um, and something that I think at this stage I would have to leave for uh, future research to delve into further. Can, oh, okay. I, I just wanted to say one more sentence, which is, um, and again, I think this kind of brings us full circle to the issue of positionality, because as I also wrote in the thesis, I think that my positionality really limited my access to these questions, despite asking about them and paying attention. I'm sure it uh, shaped what my participants shared with me, but also what I myself was able to understand. Thank you so much. Laura Jane Ogden, the time for defending your thesis has now passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to dis discuss the quality of your thesis and of your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room.
Laura Jane Ogden, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and of your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into your account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Matsukato is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Laura Jane Ogden, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Dr. Ogden, dearest Laura, now today is act two. <laughs> now for those of you who are at Sarah's defense, you know what I'm talking about. You have been part of the Motro project for the past five years. We're a team of four PhDs, one postdoc, and together we've worked to create a research program around transnational youth mobilities. And what a team. We worked together from beginning to end, from discussing the theories and concepts that we wanted to include in our research, to developing the tools with which we would be collecting information, to supporting each other in the field by discussing together the unexpected issues that inevitably arise, and finally, back in Maastricht, from reading together each other's field notes to contrast, compare, and give interpretations, to analyzing and co-authoring. As I said to Sarah, these defenses are like a play in four acts. Each act has its own story and main character, and taken together, they tell the whole story. And today is act two, and act two is called Laura. <laughs> Laura. They say that first impressions count, and I went back to my notes when you interviewed for this job, and I wrote, seems very dedicated, someone you can count on, organized, and I also wrote that I liked the literature that you had included in your application essay. It showed that you understood the topic that was awaiting you, but I also had a question mark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the question mark was, will she be able to detach herself from the focus on education sciences and be able to work herself into an entirely new field and community, question mark. <laughs> well, I can say that I was spot on with my observations about you. You are amazingly organized, amazing, really, folks, this is, this is Laura's superhero power <laughs> organization. You are very creative in finding new literatures to engage with, and you are incredibly dependable. Everything you commit to, you deliver, and with outstanding results. But I was wrong in the question that I posed. <laughs> you, I would say you did not detach yourself from your interest in education, but rather you found your own way to bring it into the project as you conducted a school ethnography, which really enriched our project as a whole. With your co-supervisor's co help, and Sarah, here I would just like to nod 
to you and thank you for all that you have done also for Laura and for the welcoming environment that you created for her and also for opening your network uh, to Laura and making it possible for her to have such an interesting and fruitful experience in Hamburg. So thank you, Sarah. But now coming back to Laura. Um, you seamlessly worked your way into the school um, from where you could observe and participate in the daily realities of the teachers and the students with migration backgrounds. And this was a real enrichment to our project. Here's another thing I wrote from my notes. Has some nice ideas about how to bring visual ethnography into the project. And boy, was I right. <laughs> As I think uh, Professor Leung has also commented on, um, it not only has you illustrated and made a beautiful um, book, but um, you co-created a film about a trip back to Ghana with one of your research participants in which you both filmed or decided on filming which elements of her journey. And of course, the original idea at the very beginning was that the film would be part of the thesis, but well, that was a little bit ambitious. Um, but you have the footage and, um, and you also won a grant that allows you to spend some time at the Granada Center for Visual Anthropology at the University of Manchester uh, to work on making the film in these coming two years, um, during which you will be working as a postdoc with us. So I'm very much looking forward to what's going to come out of that. Your expertise in visual ethnography was extremely useful in helping to make the website also of our project much more uh, interactive and engaging. And also, you helped in training the research participants for the workshop that we had um, in podcasting and audio interviews during the Finding Your Voice workshop. So, great enrichment to our project as a whole. Now, Laura, I want to end by saying how much also I appreciate just having you on the team. Um, Everyone has a role in the team dynamics, and I have always seen you as really an amazing collaborator, uh, always contributing to a true team mentality, thinking in terms of we rather than I, sharing ideas. Uh, you actively sought opportunities also for the team. I can say that our jointly uh, authored team uh, chapter on a uh, methodological chapter in a book that we've published would not have happened if you hadn't alerted me to this opportunity. And um, one last note that I had from the interview of, for this PhD position was, has creative ideas about teamwork, how to elicit common visions with a team. And boy, was I spot on with this comment. Um, but more than the concrete tools and methods for teamwork, I would say that your biggest strength are your soft skills that just make working with you an immense pleasure. So I'm pleased and honored to be able to work with you for another two years, Laura. Before I end, though, I do want to say that this amazing feat of producing a PhD thesis, of which two chapters are already published in top international journals, an additional book chapter is also published, all of the outputs, including the audio interviews, the podcast, the book, the training tools for the, from the Finding Your Voice workshop, the film footage, and all of this are in large part thanks to your intellect, your passion, your amazing organization, but it's also thanks to the wonderfully supportive partner, Bernardo, <laughs> and Benji, who came halfway along the way, and I think who is a constant reminder that life is much more than just a PhD. And of course, your wonderful parents, uh, Margaret and Keith, who have always been there for you, even at a distance from Australia and today even in presence. So now, ladies and gentlemen, just like with Sarah's defense, I'm going to end on a cliffhanger. <laughs> because this is act two of a four act play. So that everyone must come to act three tomorrow with Gladys and act four in a little while with Onalia to find the full complete story. But for those of you who were not there Monday, on Monday at Sarah's defense, I ended with a cliffhanger that together with the Motril team, this coming year, we're going to do something exceptional that I have never done before. And here I continue the cliffhanger. And this thing that we will do involves writing, but also something else, something completely 
unexpected. <laughs> to be continued in Act Three. Dearest Laura, congratulations. Thank you so much for this beautiful laudatio. And dear Dr. Ogden, I'm the second one who can say this full name, dear Dr. <laughs> Ogden, also on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you with the honor you have acquired. I now close the ceremony. And just on a housekeeping note, 